You know his words will get you farther than the film will ever go. Give him a moment of your time, he'll tell you what's wrong with the show. He knows what's good, what's bad, what's really bad. His face is just a sign. Say hello to Confused Matthew. There are two films that I get frequent requests to review. One is Saw and the other is Hostel. Well, I'm not going to review Hostel. I'm not going to watch Hostel. Hostel is just a sick film that you can't watch for anything but sick reasons, but I just thought Saw was stupid. I have no problem reviewing this thing. People who call this torture porn and the critics who condemn it for being sick and disturbing are actually giving this more credit than it ever deserved. This film is not depraved. This film is not sick. This film is not disturbing, grotesque, sickening, or perverse. It's just stupid. And of all the things that this film is not, it's also not scary. And guys, I'm a wuss bag. Everything scares me. One of my biggest fears from childhood is E.T. for God's sake. Oh God, get it off, get it off! <sighs> I was never interested or scared once during this entire film. Every attempt at horror, suspense, and grotesquerie just ends up falling flat and stupid. They shouldn't even have called this Saw, they should have just called it Traps, because that's all it is. Just a bunch of people that we don't know or care about fidgeting around in traps. So the film opens to a guy asleep in a bathtub. He gets out and finds another guy there with him. These two main characters are what I fondly refer to as the dangling carrots. The writers never make any effort to turn them or their situation into something that we can actually know, understand, or care about. We just watch them as they lead us from one situational scene to the next. Instead of creating a believable atmosphere of what people would do in a situation like this, these characters are just blab vehicles that explain the details to us like we're nine years old. Just watch as they boringly go through the motions. Where are we? I don't know. My chain won't come off. Mine also won't come off. My tape says play me. Mine does too. So much for first impressions. The two characters themselves are the first of many, many obvious setups in this film. We have the let's freak out abductee, and then the let's stay calm abductee. Gee, I wonder what this guy is going to do in the end. Eventually, these two notice a tape recorder in the hand of a dead body on the floor. And here, we have one of the first plot twists in the film. The killer, whoever he is, is omniscient. He knows exactly what the dangling carrots are going to do, how much time it will take them to do it, right up to the point where this little game he's playing will end just when he needs it to. Not a moment more or less. The dangling carrots are only as resourceful as this film needs them to be, even when the odds are that real people, not just plot props, would have been faster at figuring out some things and slower at others. The killer knows that it will occur to them to pull the plug out of the bathtub, tie it to a shirt, and lasso the tape recorder out of the dead body's hand, all as if they had been rehearsing this the day before. Watching this scene, I often wonder what the killer would have done if these two were actually as unimaginative as any real person would have been. Well, it's been three hours and I just can't figure out what to do now. Go for the tub. Hey, did you hear something? Go for the tub. Mmm, must have been one of these leaky pipes rusting. Oh, for God's sake. So eventually these two get the tape recorder just like they're supposed to and play the tapes. The first informs one dangling carrot that he may well die in this room. The second tells the other dangling carrot that his job in this whole thing is to kill the other guy before a certain time, or his family will die and he will be left to rot. And cue the functional, standard reactions. Oh god, what are we gonna do, man? Um, is it time for me to freak out yet? No? Oh, okay, okay. Um, we just need to hold it together, man. Just hold it together. So then these two think about some of the clues that were left on the tape. They eventually figure out that there is something hidden in the toilet. They take out a case that contains two saws and begin trying to cut themselves free from their chains. Lo and behold, they do not succeed. 
In fact, the kid saw breaks and he throws a fit, while the doctor, actually witnessing the kid's failure, still continues to try and cut through his. Eventually, they figure out that the killer doesn't want them to cut through their chains, but through their feet. Then the scene somewhat unevenly switches from the dangling carrots trying to get out of their situation to the doctor narrating who he thinks the killer is. During this explanation, the writers work in a plot point that is supposed to be interesting and creative, but once again doesn't go anywhere but stupid. The point here is that technically the killer hasn't killed anyone since they have technically all killed themselves. Which just isn't true. The killer, whoever he is, has killed these people personally and legally, but for his putting people in these little traps, they would still be alive. It doesn't matter if they died trying to get out of the traps, because they were only trying to get out because he put them there in the first place. The killer carries out his actions with malice and intent to kill, and whether it was the killer doing them in personally or not, this guy is going down for either murder or manslaughter. So let's have no more nonsense about how this guy technically hasn't killed anyone. Technically, he has. We then enter a flashback to where the doctor is working on a patient with a brain tumor. The doctor is called to his office and confronted by two police officers who ask him where he was last night between 11 and 1. The doctor asks why they want to know, and the police officers tell him that they want to ask him a few questions about it, and that it would be best to do it down at the station. Okay. So why did they ask him where he was last night first? Why not just bring him down to the station? Eventually, they do take him down to the station, and the doctor discovers that one of his own pen lights was found at the scene of one of the Jigsaw Killer's little traps. The doctor knows this is incriminating, but he hesitates about giving up his alibi because he's actually been with another woman last night. His own lawyer then advises him to give them his alibi now because no one's going to believe him later. Okay, believe him about what? The cops have nothing. They have a pen light. That means it could have been the doctor, or it could have been anyone else that works at that hospital. What the hell does he have to worry about? So get this. The doctor gives up his alibi, and the cops confirm that it checks out. But before they let him go, they ask him to stick around and listen to the testimony of the only person to ever survive the Jigsaw Killer's little traps. Why are they asking him to stick around and listen to this woman? For absolutely no reason. One of the officers tells him, maybe it'll trigger something. Well, what the hell is it supposed to trigger? If the doctor's alibi checks out and he wasn't at the scene of the crime, it means he has nothing to do with the case. This would be like if I was falsely accused of a bank robbery, but then they asked me to look at a lineup of possible suspects. What the hell good is that going to do? But there really is only one possible explanation for why they are making him listen to this woman's testimony. So that the audience can see the flashback. Which brings me back again to one of the many problems I have with this film, the characters. There aren't any. The characters themselves are simply plot devices. They do whatever is required of them to simply show us things. This has been problem number one. Now we get into problem number two. The actual killings themselves. What's wrong with the killings? Several things. First, every single victim in this film is totally anonymous. We have no idea who these people are. It is impossible to care about a nameless body that's thrashing around like they're having a seizure. And that's problem number two, the way in which each killing is shot. For some reason, the director of this picture decided to speed up the camera during each and every death scene. I've been told that this film is gruesome in some way. Well, I wouldn't know if that was true or not. I could barely make out what was happening in the death scene since they were all shot so fast. It's like half this film was shot in spazovision, like the director was just hyped up on too much candy or something. Not only does this make the scenes undiscernible, it also makes them look incredibly silly. Not nearly so silly, however, as the traps that are actually set up and the way that the victims behave in them. But don't even get me started on all that.